tools are solutions to problems. Today, I'd also like to talk about what can lithic analysts tell us. In deciding what a tool will look like, the maker has to solve three kinds of problems. One, what do you want the tool to do? What will be the tool's function? Obviously, different shapes work best for different functions, and different raw materials lend themselves best for different functions. Do you want the tool to scrape? Perhaps scrape a deer hide. In that case, you'd want to make a unifacial scraper such as this that is smooth and won't poke holes in your hide. Do you want to pierce something? Or do you need to punch holes? Do you need to pour liquids? Do you need your vessel to signify something about its contents or its context of use? The second problem that the maker solves involves the raw material. What raw materials do you have for making your tool and what can you make from them? For example, if you have only quartzite, you won't be able to make a point that looks like this. In other words, your raw materials may limit what you are able to make. Third, social expectations frame what solutions are seen as socially acceptable. What are the social constraints in how to make a specific tool? For example, today it is not socially acceptable to cut your meat with a tool that looks like this. Any formal tool type, the materials that were chosen, how it's shaped, what it looks like, the maker considered these three points. What is the function of the tool? What raw materials are available? And what are the social expectations for that tool? Let's move on to talk about what can lithic analysts tell us. Why hire a lithic analyst? What information could the lithic analyst supply for your report on excavations? Given that most reports about archaeology in America are written as what we call contract reports out in front of federally funded projects, by far the, the single most common analysis that the lithic analyst supplies is to help date the deposits of the site. And so this should always be your number one answer because this is the most common result from all lithic analyses in the reports. How can they help date our deposits? Through stylistic seriation and frequency seriation. Because types are limited in time, finding one can tell you what time period through stylistic seriation. Notice, we're not interested in dating just one artifact per se. We would like to date the deposit or the entire assemblage. And because types are limited in time, we can compute their relative frequencies and date sites by frequency seriation looking at the entire assemblage of all the different types and the percentages of each type within the assemblage for that time period. Analysts can also do functional analysis, telling us what tasks were being done, perhaps even by whom and where, in the region, where within the site. How can you tell the function of a stone tool? The shape tells you possibilities, but not necessarily the actual use of a tool. What could tell you actual use? Residue analysis can tell you what materials the stone tool was used on. However, the lithic analyst doesn't do the residue analysis. That is sent away for a chemist to perform. However, the lithic analyst might do microware analysis, which can tell you what materials the stone tool was used on. Let me give you a case study from South Carolina. At site 38 AK469, located on the Flamingo Bay, a multi-component Paleo-Indian through Mississippian campsite was found on the edge of this Carolina Bay in the middle Savannah River Valley. Brooks and others examined animal protein residue as well as microware on stone tools dating from the Paleo-Indian and early archaic components, straddling the Younger Dryas episode. 
As is typical of sites in South Carolina, no actual animal bone was preserved. They found all modern fauna in both components, that is, they were finding modern species rather than megafauna. They tested 27 of the stone artifacts against the following anticera listed on the left. On the right, you see the probable species that would be flagged by finding that particular antiserum. Obviously, not all of these are species that would have been found in South Carolina prehistorically. Seven of the artifacts reacted, three of them with turkey, which includes grouse or quail, one with chicken antiserum. Chickens were not here, but it could signify grouse, turkey, quail, or other gallinaceous fowl. Two with deer, which could signal deer or elk, and one with bovine antiserum, probably bison. I like this illustration because on the bottom it shows you the actual stone tools that were tested, and at the top, little pictures of the different animals whose antisera was found and the number of tools that had that on them. Going from Paleo-Indian, Early Archaic, Middle Archaic, Late Archaic, and up into Woodland, Mississippian for a number of sites in the Central Savannah River area. Again, animal bone itself is not often preserved in the acidic soils here in the Southeast. And so it's only from immunological studies such as this that we can learn about the animals that were being hunted or killed or processed. So what is lithic microware? Well, you experimentally make a sharp edge and use it on material. Then you put that edge under a high power microscope and see whether the use left a signature pattern. As you can see from these examples, uh, you would also keep track of how long you uh, performed that use. They detected microware on 31 stone artifacts and were able to infer a number of actions. Both Clovis points, the three early archaic Taylor points, and the two point fragments all had been used for projection. Three of the tools showed butchery, 16 showed hide working, two of them showed scraping with an indeterminate material, one of them showed cutting, five of them showed bone working, one showed antler working, one showed woodworking, one showed whittling, and one was used, but they couldn't tell what material it was used against. Microware analysis had been pioneered by Lawrence Keeley and Semenov. In microware analysis in general, you look at the striations and the polish that result from using a tool edge on various materials, such as wood, bone, plant, meat. And of course, you do this using modern stone tools with fresh, sharp edges. Experimental archaeology then provides material for comparison. Performance of blind trials shows that an expert can distinguish some motions in some materials. Now, if you have archaeological specimens that you think you might want to perform microware analysis on, you need to individually wrap each tool as you take it out of the ground immediately upon re recovery. Thus, you won't be getting damage or wear from rubbing against other artifacts. Lithic analysts also look at the reduction sequence. If you recall, 91% of the stone in flint napping ends up as debitage, and only 9% ends up in the finished tool. So the reduction sequence can tell you a lot of information about the tools that were being made and about the thought patterns of the makers and the manufacturing sequence. The lithic analysts who do this sort of analysis usually flintknap to learn more about the reduction sequence. Lithic analysts may also look at the raw materials that were used. They may perform petrological analyses looking for the source of the raw materials used. That means they also would build a comparative collection, going to the various quarries and comparing those rocks to the rocks that they've recovered. The raw materials might be able to tell you about the movement of people, 
or trade routes and social relations. So the types of lithic analyses include dating your deposits using seriation, functional analysis, analysis of the reduction sequence, and analysis of raw materials. Remember, the goal of archaeology in the end is to talk about human behavior. And so hopefully your lithic analyst will be able to contribute to your report by talking about human behavior regarding stone tools.